to talk to you about something today that's very important, near and dear to my heart, has always been a deep subject for me, and not just mere rhetoric. You hear a lot of talk about revival nowadays. And uh, for some of you, you may hear the word revival and go, what in the world is revival? If you grew up in the church, then you know that word well, because we talked about it all the time. In fact, years and years ago, they used to have these things called revival, and it was two weeks long. The first week of revival, and it was a series of services, the first week of revival was set to get the hearts of the church right. The second week of revival was meant to bring in people who did not know Jesus and win them to Jesus Christ. And then the church got to feel like maybe we didn't need that as much. And so we went down to one week of revival and tried to mesh them together and join everything into one. And then we said, well, you know what? It's just an awful lot to ask people to come out six, seven days a week. You know, maybe we ought to just shorten that down to three days. And we did. Or four days. Sunday through Wednesday. And then people started griping and complaining. and said, well, you know, I, I come home from work and I'm tired and... I really can't do that, and I'm just not sure if I'm going to be able to make it. And then church leaders say, well, I'll tell you what we'll do. We're going to make it easy on you. We're going to do it one day, and we'll do it on Sunday when you're already here. And then people say, well, pastor, I'll be there on Sunday morning, but, you know, Sunday night and get ready for work the next day. And, you know, I'm tired, and, you know, got to get the kids in bed, and probably not going to come back next Sunday morning. Well, then the church said, well, you know what? Let's just do away with revival altogether. Well, let me tell you what precedes any great move of God. Prayer. And when you stop having organized revival, and let me, let me explain what I mean by that in just a moment, you also stop having organized prayer. Okay? Because you don't feel the need to anymore. It's not a big event anymore. Nothing big is happening anymore. Here's what I'm talking about today. I'm not talking about... A revival in the sense of a series of meetings. Listen, you can have a series of services till the cows come home. But if God does not send revival, if the Holy Spirit of God does not blow across the hearts and lives of men, women, boys and girls, all you're doing is showing up and having a series of meetings and that's it. I got to tell you something. Your time and my time is way too valuable just to come to church and just to have a series of meetings and call a revival so we can check it off our list and say, Whoa, man, we had revival at our church. You know what? I'm okay with coming to church. I love being in church. If I had my way about it, I know this is not most people, but I would be in a service every day of the week. You know why? Because I love being around the people of God. I love being around worship. I love being around the Word. I can't get enough of the Word. I can't get enough of worship. In fact, as a kid growing up, they always made fun of me. They said, man, every time the church doors are open, you're there. Well, there's a reason. Because if I wasn't there, I was liable to be doing something that I shouldn't have been doing. So it helped me to stay close to the fire. To stay close to where the action was happening at. And so even in, in service, people say, well, why do you always sit on the very front row? Because I don't want to get distracted. I want to get close to the fire where it's hot. Because you know what? That's the only kind of burnt I want to get. All right? I don't want to get burnt by the sun. I don't want to get burnt by an iron. I don't want to get burnt by a hot oven. I want to get burnt by the fire of God and let it just burn and burn and burn. Amen? Yeah. That's the revival I'm talking about. I'm talking about the revival that when God shows up, it'll leave you a changed man, woman, boy, or girl. I'm talking about a revival that when God shows up, we don't look at the clock anymore. When God shows up, people are on their faces around the altar, weeping and broken and crying out to God. That's the revival I'm talking about. I'm talking about a revival that when the Holy Spirit falls, sin is repented of and sin is gotten rid of and holiness becomes the name of the game. That's the kind of revival I'm talking about. The kind of revival I'm talking about will wake up the dead. 
The kind of revival I'm talking about will heal the sick. The kind of revival that I'm talking about will make, uh, listen, a, a lame man get up and walk. The kind of revival that I'm talking about will leave us here to weigh hours in the morning because we just can't bring ourselves to go home. That's revival. Let me tell you why people get tired of going to church. Because when we go to service after service after service, and all it is is just a lot of rhetoric, just a lot of dead talk. The Spirit of God doesn't move. The power of God doesn't show up. The power of God's not made manifest. Then we leave feeling like, man, I've just wasted my time. And many of the times we do. Many of the times we do. Half the time, listen, I remember going into churches, preaching and walking away thinking, man, you know what? I wasted my time in theirs. It amazes me how we'll prepare for work. We'll prepare for school. We'll prepare for our hobbies. But we don't prepare for the house of God. It's amazing how we walk in the house of God. And what we do is we walk in and, and we come in and we sit down on the front row. And we sit back and we go, well, bless me if you can, Lord. Hello? Well, Lord, I'm tired. I've had a long week. And if you can bless me, you just go right ahead. I'm Take your best shot. I'm going to sit right here until you do. Oh, they want me to stand and sing. Bless God, I can't stand and sing. I'm tired. Don't he know I've worked all week long? Whew, goodness gracious. Marty, I didn't get much sleep last night. How about you? I didn't get a whole lot of sleep. I think I'm going to sit here and snooze during his sermon today. <laughs> Catch up on my sleep. What he's talking about is probably not important anyways. I think I'm going to go to the bathroom. I'll stay a little longer. Yeah. Are you with me? Listen, when revival comes, you won't even be able to leave the room because you're afraid you'll miss something. When revival comes, everybody around will be showing up to find out what's going on down there. Because there's something about the fire of God that draws people. Revival. Revival. That's what we're talking about. Revival. Depending on your background, the word revival might carry some baggage with it. It, it might kind of sound old-fashioned in concept to you. Because so many times we've labeled it everything except for really what it is. I don't even like calling it revival anymore. Because people say, oh, I'm, I'm going to revival. I said, listen, revival won't happen until the Holy Spirit falls. Then revival will come. So I don't even want to call it that because I don't want to give us an opportunity to confuse what revival really is. And it's not a series of sermons. You can bring in the greatest preacher. You can bring in the greatest musicians. You can bring in the greatest singers. You can do whatever you want to do. You can work it up. You can work it out. You can do whatever you want to do. But if the Spirit of God does not show up, revival will not come. I'll tell you what you can do. You can help God to see revival come. You can help God to bring about revival in this day and age in which we live in. And oh, while some of those elements might be present during a time of revival. Listen, i got a buddy of mine right now. His church has been in revival type meetings for 32 weeks straight. Every single day. Day And they're going for three and four and five hours at a time. He, I said, how in the world do you get people to stay? He said, oh, it ain't about getting people to stay. I can't keep them away. I said, really? He said, yeah, man. Listen, this is in a Baptist church. Hello? He said, Pastor D, he said, you won't believe this. He said, listen, I am tired. He said, three hours in, I'm exhausted, I'm tired. But he said, I go over and I sit down and I watch people continuously get up, come to the altar over and over. They just come to the altar. I see people standing down the altar with their hands lifted up. I see people weeping. I see people shouting. I see sinners coming and repenting of their sins and giving their heart and life to Jesus. He said, we've seen people healed. We've seen all all sorts of things happen in the church. And he said, you know what? I can't take credit for any of it. But he said, all these weeks, every single day, we have met for worship. Our worship team has continued to worship. 
He said the evangelist had to leave. Another guy stepped right in. That evangelist had to leave. Another guy stepped right in. But he said, you know what? The Holy Spirit of God has not stopped one single bit. And he said, I keep telling people over and over, listen, tonight might be our last night. And he said, toward the end of the service, I said, folks, listen, we're coming back tomorrow night at 7 o'clock. And we're going to see what God does. We may not go on past tomorrow night, but tomorrow night, you'll be here at 7 o'clock. He said, Pastor D, at 4 o'clock, people are waiting in line to get in the door. I said, what do you attribute that to? And he said, well... He said, I started preaching on revival about six months to a year ago. He said, we started having special times of prayer for revival. He said, our people got it in them to start asking God for revival. They started coming to the altar, and they're weeping, and they're broken, and they're getting rid of sin, and they're getting their hearts and lives right with God. And he said, and it just escalated from there. And then he said, then we had this evangelist come in, and he threw some gasoline on the Spirit of God. He threw some gasoline on the fire of God. And he said, man, it just blazed up. And he said, it hadn't let up sin. See, that's what happens when revival comes. When revival comes, you don't go, my Lord, have we been here an hour? I got to get out of here. I'm hungry. I got I to gotta go get something to eat. No, see, when revival comes, there's a different kind of hunger that needs to be satisfied. When revival comes, you can't get enough. You don't want to leave. You want more worship. You want more preaching. In fact, sometimes the word will just come. In fact, sometimes there may not be a message at all. It may just be worship and worship and praying and worship and reading scriptures. It may not be a sermon at all. But we got this in our mind that revival has got to look a certain way. It's got to sound a certain way. Oh, and trust me, there are some elements of revival that can still be there and it's not a big deal. But it's not the same as evangelism or sharing your faith. No. You're going to see unbelievers come to Christ when revival happens. You're going to see people born into the family of God. Oh, and you're going to see emotions connected and emotions involved in revival. Listen, I am a free worshiper. I love to worship. I love to lift my hands. I love to sing. I love to shout. I love to dance what little bit I can. All right? I love to dance. I Listen, if the Holy Spirit tells me to take off running, I'm going to take off running. I'm not worried about what anybody else thinks. Somebody says, well, I, I just don't understand that. That's just foreign to me. Listen, it's foreign to a lot of people in the body of Christ. You know why? Because what we've done is we've said, God, you have to look this way in this size box. And you come out when I let you out. But when the Spirit of God falls, you cannot hold God back. You cannot put Him in a box. Revival. Be careful though, because even though emotions will be involved, revival shouldn't be confused with mere emotionalism. I was in a church one time, and I'll never forget, I was preaching... And man, oh man, oh man, we had a service and a half. It was dynamite. The next service we got up and the pastor stood and he said, listen. He said, we're going to worship in spirit and in truth. And he said, emotions are fine. He said, but if all you've got is emotions, when you, when you shout... When you clap, when you sing, when you dance, he said, and when your feet hit the ground and you don't live any differently after it, you got wrapped up in emotions. Are you with me? It's good, isn't it? You got wrapped up in emotions. And I thought, oh, man, preacher, that'll preach. And he looked at me and he said, Pastor, he said, hang on just a second. He said, you're, you're coming, but he said, I got I to tell them some things. And he went on to tell his people, he said, listen, He said, I know I've watched you guys get up and 
football games and basketball games and all these different sports and y'all are hooping and hollering and shouting and all that kind of stuff. He said, that's one thing. But when you get in the house of God and he said, yeah, emotions are going to be connected because we are emotional creatures. We're emotional beings. But he said, I want to tell you something. He said, when the spirit of God falls, it will not just excite you. It will not just energize you, but it will transform you. It will change your heart. It will change your life and when you walk out those doors you will live differently than you lived before you came in here today amen that's revival that's revival so what is revival who's it for maybe you're here today and you're tired of just being a good enough Christian maybe you're overloaded you're worn out Maybe sometimes you feel as if you're just going through the emotions of the Christian life. Maybe you're here today and you feel like your faith is running spiritually on empty. Maybe you've come today and you experience a heaviness or a shame more than joy and freedom in your walk with God. Maybe you miss the excitement and the power and the closeness that you once felt with God. If so, I want you to know this is you today. This is for you. This is your day. See, I remember as a seven-year-old boy running down the old-fashioned altar, Madison Street Baptist Church, McMinnville, Tennessee. I'll never forget, everybody in that church was deader than 4 o'clock. I kid you not. They were deader than 4 o'clock. I'll never forget. Listen, even the lady playing the piano, it was... Down, 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 down. You, you know, and, and listen, something could happen in that service, and they'd all just sit here like this. Amen. <laughs> Myrtle, what time is it? Dead. Dead. But I'm going to tell you, God did something in this boy's life that morning. I'm going to tell you, God stirred something up in this boy that morning. That morning, this boy saw the cross. That morning, this boy saw Jesus hanging on that cross. And I saw his blood flow freely from that cross. And it flowed right toward me. And I was standing right in the middle of that precious crimson flood. And that morning, oh, when I knelt, the blood fell. Hallelujah. Glory to God. I plunged beneath that flood, and I came up losing all of my guilty stains. Listen, that's what happened to this boy. I will never forget. I came up from that little old-fashioned altar. I could not turn the waterworks off. I mean, the tears were flowing. Oh, man, I was a huffing and a puffing, and not because I was mad. I was huffing and puffing because I was glad. Amen? I got up that morning. I'm telling you what. The Lord, had, God had given me a joy that could not be taken away from me. I was so fired up, revved up. Listen, on my way home, my parents said to me, they said, now listen, son, you just had an emotional experience. You didn't really get saved. <laughs> I wasn't about to talk back to my parents, but I thought, oh, wait, oh yeah, you want to bet? You want to bet? Listen, here's what I did. I got home. I was so fired up. I was pumped up. I was excited. I called every one of my friends in the neighborhood. I called a special club meeting. Yeah, we had a club in our neighborhood. I was the president. I called a club meeting. They all came gathered around, and guess what I did? As best I could, I preached my heart out for 30 minutes, telling them what God had just done in my life. And I didn't know how to do it, but I told everybody else to do what I did. And I led several of my friends to Jesus that day. We started going to church together. Listen, I got excited that day. I got a fire lit in me that day. And it has never gone out. Hallelujah. And if your fire goes out, you need to start looking up. You need to start checking up. You need to throw some, uh, some uh, uh, flame, some uh, gasoline on that flame and let it fire up. Many of us are dead. We've lost the excitement. We've lost the power. We've lost the closeness. 
that we once felt with God. Heard a guy say just the other day, made me sick to my stomach. He said, Pastor Dean, he said, I remember when God walked close with me. He said, man, he said, I was on fire for God. He said, I don't know what's happened, but he said, God said he'd never leave me for forsake me, but he did, he did, he did. And I said, son, God didn't leave you. You left him. You're the one who moved. You're the one who walked away. You're the one who let life happen. You're the one who let priorities get out of order. You're the one that started putting the world in God's place. You're the one that started elevating other idols in your life besides the only one that you're supposed to idolize and worship. You're the one that moved, not God. Don't blame it on God. In fact, he's still right there with you. And when you repent and you put everything else out of sight and you put him back on the throne of your heart as Lord. You see, everybody wants a Savior. Not everybody wants him as Lord. Amen? When he's Lord, that means he's in control. He's in charge. He calls the shots. He's the CEO of your life. Well, now, wait a minute, preacher. I, I don't want to go to hell, but I don't want all that now. <laughs> You know, I don't, I don't want to go to hell when I die, but, but I'm, I'm okay with calling the shots in my life. I can handle it. No, you can't. If you could have, you'd have been doing it all along. No, you can't. None of us can. Let me show you something in the Word. Psalm 85, verse 6 through 9. 85, 6 through 9. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? Will you not revive us again? What does it mean to revive something? It means to bring back alive that which was dead. To raise up that which is lifeless. To breathe again into that which is breathless. To rise up. To awaken. The psalmist is asking God, will you not revive us again? Do it again, Lord. Listen, we need some preachers today who will preach and pray. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Do it again. Listen, you can go back as far as history will go back, and you can see great revival movements over and over and over and over again. I remember going into a church one time and preaching, and I was talking to the guy about the church, and I said, hey, tell me about your church. Tell me what God's done in your church. And he said, oh, preacher. He said, I remember back in 1976, we had a revival here, and he went on for an hour telling me all that God did in that revival in 1976. I said, is that the last time you've seen God move in your church? Oh, preacher, that was some revival. Man, God showed up. Listen to me. I don't want to live off of a revival from 1976. Did you hear what I said? I want a fresh, new movement of the Spirit of God. I want God to show up fresh and mighty in power. I want to see something happen that I ain't seen in my generation. I want revival. I'm not talking about a series of services. I want a revival. That's what I want. That's what I want. Listen, I go back and I read about all those revivals down through the years. And I've got but one thing on my heart. Lord, do it again. Lord, do it again. Lord, do it again. I am not satisfied with reading it in a book. I want to experience it. Lord, do it again. And let it start right here in me. Mm. Do it again. Listen, churches are dying all around us. They're closing their doors. Did you not pass one right down the street up here? Yeah, Springhead. United Methodist Church. In fact, they call me six months before they close their doors. I will never forget that. And they said, what in the world can we do? To keep from closing our doors. Remember that, Marty? What can we do? I said, stop doing what you've always done. Do it different. 
Well, you know, but we, we can't do that. Well, if you keep doing what you've always done, you'll keep getting what you've always got. Amen? They said, well, what would you suggest we do? I said, well, I can't tell you that I'm not God. I can tell you what we did, but I can't tell you what you need to do. One thing I can tell you is if you'll get on your face before God, if you'll lay aside all of your traditions, uh uh-oh, (laughs) uh-oh, there's a problem. If you'll lay aside all of your denominational traditions, if you'll lay aside all of your personal traditions, all your personal preferences, if you'll lay it all aside, get on your face with God and not get up until God has shown you His plan, then you'll know. Oh, you'll know. It'll turn around, the fire of God will fall, and you'll have to build a bigger building. Instead, they kept doing what they'd always done, and they just are in the process of selling theirs now. I remember driving by one day and I watched them loading out all of this furniture and all of this stuff. And it was sad. They're just giving it to other churches. That is great. It's continued to be used in the body of Christ. That is awesome. Praise God. But what was sad was people are willing to hold on to their traditions and their denominational preferences and their personal preferences. They're willing to hold on to what they've always had rather than experiencing what they might could have. It's always amazing to me. I've listened to people pray all of my life, God, send revival. But then when God send revival, that means he's going to change things. It won't look the same as what it did before. Now, God, we don't want you to mess with anything. We don't want you to change anything. We just want the house full. i got to tell you something. I, I really hate to tell you this. What they really mean is we want the place packed because we need your money. Sorry. That's just the hard, cold truth. That's what a lot of churches will tell you. They won't tell you we need your money. But what they really say is, God, we want you to fill the house so that people will then we, they'll give their money and then we can do what we want. Here's the problem with the church. We are not here to do what we want. We're here to do what God wants us to do. And it is never what we want to do. <laughs> that's, that's the truth. In fact, most of the time when God tells me to do something, I argue and fuss and fight with God for a few days before I finally just give up and say, okay, you win. I'm going to do it. Because usually it means it's going to take a sacrifice from me. It usually means it's going to make me uncomfortable. It usually means it's going to take more time away from me. But in the end, he wins. I'm going with God When you go with God, you cannot go wrong. Lord, do it again. Will you not revive us again that your people may rejoice in you? What do you mean rejoice in you? Because listen, I have never in my life been in a revival that revival fires fall and people go, oh my goodness, I don't like this. No, I've never seen that. In fact, I have been in revivals when the pastor said, Tonight's the end. And I never say that. Because just because we don't have another service tomorrow night doesn't mean God ends. He's still working. Amen? He's still moving. But I hear the pastor say, tonight is our last service. And I've watched people cry and say, oh, pastor, please go on. Please go on. Because when revival comes, it's not man-made. It is not manufactured. It is of God. And you know it. You ever notice how man-made revivals, boy, they'll wear you out. They'll exhaust you. But there's something about a spirit revival. When the spirit of God falls fresh, there's something about that kind of revival. Man, that you are energized. You're running on adrenaline at that point. It is a Holy Ghost adrenaline. Amen? And you can't stop. You don't want to stop. He goes on to say, show us your mercy, Lord, and grant us your salvation. I will hear what God the Lord will speak, for he will speak peace to his people and to his saints, but let them not turn back to folly. Don't let them go back to their sinful ways. 
it amazing how we want God to move, but we're still shacking up with the devil? We want to see a move of God, but we're still dating evil spirits. We want to see God do something, but we can't let go of the ungodliness and the evil in our lives to grab hold of what God wants to do in our lives. Isn't that amazing? And we don't understand it. Listen to him. He still speaks. Let them not turn back to folly. Surely his salvation is near to those who fear him. That glory may dwell in our land. Listen, guys, revival is about the glory of God. It is not about you and it is not about me. It is about the glory of God in the midst of his people. In the whole chapter of Psalm 85, the whole thing is a prayer for revival. If you set the whole thing into context, you have to divide it into four different parts. The first part is uh, verses 1 through 3, and it gives a past instance of revival in Israel. And then verses 4 through 7, the psalmist comes out and he gives that plea for God to do it again. Lord, you sent revival before. God, you have stirred the waters before. Lord, you have sent fire from heaven before. Do it again, Lord. Do it again. Do it again. And then in verses 8 through 9, there's a pause to hear how the Lord would answer And then in verses 10 through 13, you see a promise of future restoration. Listen, I don't know what is broken in your life. I don't know what is going so wrong in your life. But I can tell you this. When revival shows up, when God comes, when the Spirit of God sweeps across the people, listen, restoration will always be at the front and center. Restoration. Because God is in the restoration business. Amen? Amen? Don't believe me? Ask somebody who's gone through divorce. Don't believe me? Ask that alcoholic. Ask that drug addict. Ask that prostitute. Don't believe me? Ask somebody who has been broken by sin, broken by evil, broken by the world. And God has reached down in his mercy and his grace and he has raised them back up and he's poured fire into their spirit. You ask them today. I'm telling you, God is a restoring God. He is a restoring God. Religion will kill you. Religion will destroy you. But God will always restore you. Amen? Yeah, the world says you're washed up. You're done away with. God can't use you. But God says, oh, don't you listen to them. I got something good for you. I got something good for you. You listen to me. You listen to me. You listen to the world. You will stay bound in bondage of chains. You'll stay in addiction. You'll stay in prostitution. You'll stay in alcoholism. You'll stay in all of these things. But when revival fires start falling, glory to God, you will be set free. Hallelujah. That's what I'm talking about today. You want revival? You want revival? Come on now. You want revival? It's going to take more than a two-minute prayer before you eat your dinner at night. You want revival? It's going to take more than a verse that you got on uh, Facebook this morning and decide to post because that one verse won't get you through. Amen? You want revival? You need to get on your face before God with an open word before you and let the Holy Spirit of God speak to your heart. Let Him begin able to cleanse you and set you free of all the sin and all the evilness in your life. You say, oh, preacher, you don't understand. I'm good. I don't have any sin in my life. And the Bible says you are a liar. We're all sinners. Oh, but preacher, I've been saved. Listen, I've been saved too. And I've told you before, because I am saved, I am a saint of God. But I am still capable of sinning. I don't like it when I sin. How do you know you're saved? (laughs) Because when I sin, the Holy Spirit says, Oh, you know you shouldn't have done that. In fact, before I do what I did, the Holy Spirit sits on my shoulder and says, Now, D, you really want to do that? Is that profitable for you? Is that good for you? Is that going to bless the body? Is that going to bring a reproach on your family? Is that going to bring you closer to me or is that going to push you further away from me? In 
In fact, if it keeps you from God, it's not of God. Revival is a supernatural work of God. It's not something we can manufacture. So what will it take? God's looking for two things in our lives, our church, and our nation. The first thing he's looking for is submission. Submission. Church, are we going to submit? Are we going to submit to God and his mercy and his love for us? Oh, but, but I thought God was a God of love. I didn't think that, that, that God forced me. No, no, God doesn't force us to do anything. But because of his mercy and because of his love and because of his grace, we ought to want to submit to him. We ought to want to follow his lead. But doesn't that make me in bondage? Doesn't that make me captive to God? (laughs) Paul said, you know what? I've been in chains and bondage before. I've been a slave to sin. But now I'm a slave to the Most High God. Oh, listen, there's a difference in the slavery that comes with God. You're not in bondage. You're not in captivity. In fact, being in submission to God, being a slave unto God, means that you are free. Hallelujah. It's freedom. It's not captivity. It's not drudgery. It's freedom. He's looking for us to submit to him. Just told a pastor this week. The church is getting ready to close their doors. And he said, Pastor D, I need one last ditch effort. What can we do to keep from closing the doors? You know what I told him? Submit to God. Submit to God. We don't want to submit because that means we are no longer in control. It's not about you. Your life. It's not about you. It's not about what you want. It's not about what's going to make you happy. Yeah, but God wants me to be happy, don't he? Listen, God's not out for you to be happy. He's out for you to be holy. Happiness comes and goes. Somebody told me the other day, they said, oh, preacher, they said, I am so happy. I said, give it 30 minutes. That's the truth, right? You ever met people and you said, my goodness, I am almost positive they're bipolar. They're happy one minute and they are sad the next. They're up and they're down. Their highs are really high and their lows are really low. Are you with me? Listen, I understand. I get it. We all have good days. We all have bad days. But I want you to know that we are to have joy in the midst of persecution. We're to have joy in the midst of sorrow. We're to have joy in the midst of troubles and trials. But Pastor D, I thought when I became a Christian that that all of my troubles were gone. No, your troubles just began. Jesus said in this world you will have troubles. Well, why didn't think he meant that? Well... That's the problem. A lot of people don't think Jesus meant a lot of things he said. But he did. Amen? Submission. That's what he's looking for. Secondly is obedience. Obedience to his word. So, oh, preacher, I need to get in another Bible study. I had this lady one time at my church. I'll never forget. Every, oh my goodness, every time you turn around, there was another Bible. She was in another Bible study. And another Bible study, and another Bible study, and another Bible study, and another Bible study. And I'm going to be honest with you, she wore me out with Bible studies. And she came to me one day, and she said, Pastor D, she said, I want us to start another Bible study. And I said, stop right there. Hold it. Time out. She said, what do you mean? I said, hang on a second. You need to understand this. I don't want to do another Bible study. I want you to obey what you've already learned in all the other Bible studies first. There are some people who just get spiritually fat. You know what I mean? Yeah, they just want to study, 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 study. Study is not for you to get more knowledge. Study is for you to learn and then live it out in your life. Listen, some of us can't move on to the next thing until we've learned to be obedient to God in the last thing he taught us. 
And then we wonder why we have to keep going through troubles and trials and tribulations over and over and over. And God says, when you get it, we can move on. Until then, you're going to keep going through it and going through it and going it. Because I'm trying to teach you something. I'm trying to do something in you. I'm trying to set you on fire. I'm trying to change you. I'm trying to transform you. Well, where does it start? It starts with confessing our sin and repenting. Listen. Whatever you keep in the darkness, you can never be healed from. Whatever you keep in the darkness, whatever you keep in the closet, whatever you keep hidden, you'll never be able to heal from. Confess it. Repent of it. Listen, if you've not been in church very long, listen, confession just means agreeing with God about your sin. That's it. I lied. You mean I got to say that? Yes. Confess it. Confess, agree with God that you are a sinner. Agree with God that you have some sin in your life. And I love this when people say, God, forgive me of all my sin. Can I just, listen, I'm a, I'm a big picture guy. But here's something I think you and I need to understand. We didn't sin big picture. We sin detailed. Why instead of saying, God... God, I just want you to forgive me of all my sins. Why don't you say, God, forgive me where I lied to my neighbor. Forgive me where I looked at that woman and lusted after her. Forgive me where I looked at something on the internet that I shouldn't have been looking at. Forgive me where I cheated on my taxes. Forgive me. Get this. Hang on. This is where I get in trouble at. Forgive me where I sat down at the table and I ate too much. We don't talk about that one, do we? I love it when churches, we love to talk about the big sins, you know? The big seven, you know? That's what we, the big sin. Listen, the Bible says all unrighteousness is. Then why can't we agree with God about that? You didn't sin in bulk. How about confessing and repenting in detail? Ooh. How about repenting in detail? Who needs revival? We do. We do. I do. You do. And so this morning, I'm inviting you to begin the process of having your joy restored. I'm inviting you the process to having your passion and your zeal return. I'm inviting you today in the process of having your fire rekindled and your relationship restored to rightness with a holy God today. Some of us in this place today need to confess some sin. Some of us in this place today need to repent of sin. Some of us here today need to extend forgiveness or we need to ask for forgiveness. Some in this place today just simply need to pray for God to turn his searchlight upon your heart and search my heart, oh God, and see if there be any wicked way in me. However, all of us need to come and pray this simple prayer. Are you ready? Lord, change me. Lord, Change me. Now coming up April the 16th, 17th, and 18th is Reignite. It is four services of where we are all putting aside our agendas. And we're all coming together as one family, as one body. And we are getting on our faces and we are crying out to God... God, send revival, do it again. And I'm going to ask you even now, would you just block that off on your calendar? Now, I know some of you have to work, and if you've got to work, I understand. But if you can get here for one service, or two services, or three services, or all four, get here. I am telling you, you will not regret it. You want to see God move? Get here. You want to see the spirit of God blow? Get here. Somebody said, well, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. That's the truth. Amen? Jesus could come and stand right here in our midst, and we would miss him because we got so many other important things to do. 
What if you just blocked off those four services and you grabbed everybody you knew of and you got them here? What if it was your child who's lost and dying and going to hell and you only had one last chance to get them to Jesus? Would you get them here? If it was a brother or sister, aunt, uncle, mom, dad, and you had one last opportunity, would you get them here? Or maybe it's you. Maybe you've been wondering, God, I don't, my life is a mess. I don't know how to get it straightened out. God, I don't know how in the world I'm going to do it. What if this is your time? Guys, listen. Up until then, we're going to pray like mad. And we're going to prepare our hearts. My job as your pastor is to make sure we're prepared and ready. So that when the man of God comes, he is going to come and bring the word. And we're going to be ready. And we're going to respond. That's how we help God. Is we start doing our part. We start praying. We start fasting. We start cleaning up our lives. We start getting ourselves acclimated to the atmosphere of revival. And trust me, when it comes, I'm ready for it. I am so ready for a sweeping wind of revival. One that all of Hillsborough and Polk County will look and go, My Lord, what is happening at Graceway? Are you ready? Are you ready? You ready for him to do it again? Stand to your feet this morning. Maybe you're here today and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus. I want to tell you that today you can do that. Maybe you're watching online and you say, Pastor D, I've never given my life to Jesus. You can do that today. The Bible says that if you will believe in your heart that Jesus Christ, the Son of God, if you will believe in your heart that Jesus Christ died to forgive you of all of your sins, and with your mouth confess Jesus is Lord, you'll be saved. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. It's not hard. It's not difficult. You can do that. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment? If you're here today and you've never given your heart and life to Jesus, I'm going to invite you right now to believe it in your heart and with your mouth pray with me and confess it. And ask Jesus to come into your life and be your Lord and your Savior. Would you pray with me right now, all those at home on our iCampus, would you pray with me, dear Lord Jesus? I confess that I'm a sinner. I confess there's nothing good in me. I confess that without you, I cannot make it to heaven. I confess that through the blood of Jesus Christ, I can be saved. I receive your forgiveness. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for me. I receive you as my Savior. And I enthrone you on the heart of my life as Lord. Thank you, Jesus, for saving me. Help me to follow you all the days of my life. In Jesus' name. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Nobody's looking around. I wonder if there's anybody in this house today, anybody today that prayed that prayer and you meant it, you prayed that prayer for the first time and you gave your heart and life to Jesus. You say, Pastor D, I prayed that prayer. I meant it. I gave my heart and life to Christ. If that's you, would you just slip your hand up really, really high so I can see it and rejoice with you? Anybody? Anybody? Pastor D, that was me. I prayed that prayer. I meant it. Young person, mom, dad, boy, girl, grandmother, grandfather, anybody? Listen, online, if you prayed that prayer, would you write me, Pastor, at graceway365.com. Let me know about your decision to follow Jesus. I want to help you to follow in your next step.